Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture of 6837. Today we're going to continue our discussion of rendering and adding detail to the scenes that we're creating by adding really high frequency information using textures in texture mapping. We're going to talk about two different strategies for introducing textures and detailed shading into our scenes using textured maps from a mesh into an image, uh, as well as procedural shading, uh, which is going to introduce the idea of a shader, which will be very important in the remainder of this course. So as some high level motivation, uh, take a look at these images from The Matrix. At this point, The Matrix is a pretty dated uh, film. But even with this early film technology, it's pretty amazing what they were able to accomplish. Uh, in particular, uh, in each pair of images here, one of these images is rendered and one of them is not, it's just a photograph. So many of the characters in this film actually had digital doubles, which is important for some of the special effects. And the amazing thing, I know these pictures are a little bit pixelated, is that it's really hard to distinguish which one is real and which one is the digital double. Um, the realism of rendering in these movie effects studios has reached all kinds of heights of detail and fidelity to the real world that I think were unimaginable 20, 30 years ago. Now, this character is obviously quite a large distance away from what our ray tracer that we've developed so far in this course is capable of rendering. And one of the big reasons why is that we lack high frequency detail. So in our previous lecture, we talked about how to add material properties to a 3D shape when we render it in our ray tracer. But the entire shape, for example, the entire teapot or bunny seems to be our running uh, example in this course, was composed of a single material. Contrastingly, if you look at the character here, obviously he has many different materials moving along the 3D model. Uh, just even along his skin, the texture is changing depending on where you are on the skin. There's hair, glasses, clothing, shoes, and so on. And every single one of these things has its own material property that can change depending on where you are. So today we're going to try and bridge that gap a little bit more. In particular, we're going to talk about how to introduce spatial variation to the materials that we've already talked about so far. So the bad assumption that we're going to try and fix today is that the BRDF of a given object is independent of the location on the surface. Now, we motivated this a bit at the end of our previous lecture, but as an example, of course, if we look at the teapot on the left here, this has just a uniform BRDF, and it doesn't look particularly realistic. The reality is that most objects in our world look more like the second and the third example here, where the texture is a function of position along the surface. And so essentially what we're going to do today is give our ray tracer the capability to intersect a ray with the piece of geometry and then read off at a very local scale what the BRDF is at that point, rather than for the entire object, and then carry out the shading computation the way that we suggested in the previous lecture. That is to say, we're going to allow BRDF parameters to vary over space, or really over, I would say, the surface. And so, of course, when we do that, I think oftentimes we think about color as the main texture that we can attach to a triangle mesh. And indeed, that is going to be one of the main uh, goals of today's lecture, is to have diffuse color vary with your spatial position. But actually, an overlooked um, property that I think many of us don't think about is that other parameters and information can vary from point to point too. For example, the specularity, the exponent, and the Fong shading model. And we'll see a particularly cool trick that actually stores the normal vector to a surface in a texture in order to add some high frequency texture in detail that we wouldn't be able to see otherwise. Now, achieving this kind of spatial variation is quite tricky. Um, initially, you might think of storing this information, like the color or the BRDF, um, on the vertices of a triangle mesh, right? So maybe sitting underneath our geometry here is a bunch of triangles. And when we look at these triangles, a very simple way that we could add detail might be to attach a different value at every vertex. But I would argue that this strategy is unlikely to work terribly well when you have an extremely high frequency texture 
like this kind of funky teapot in the middle of the slide here, right? Because then you would need a different triangle every time the texture makes a change. And so for that reason, we're going to use two different strategies other than use the finest possible mesh uh, to make this a bit more feasible. In particular, uh, one approach is to store texture in a two-dimensional image. So that's the image you see on the right. Sometimes this is called a texture map. And then to store essentially a mapping from the vertices of the triangle mesh into the texture. So you're storing all the high frequency information in an image and the geometry is still a relatively low frequency uh, signal. We'll talk about that during the first part of our lecture today. And in the second part of our lecture today, we'll discuss procedural shading, meaning that rather than storing high frequency detail like texture in an image that we're going to just kind of wrap around a surface, uh, we're going to write a little program that computes the shading information as a function of your location in space and does so on the fly. Uh, in particular, we're going to talk about one strategy called Perlin noise, which was particularly impactful over the last 20, 30 years uh, in creating high frequency textures without blowing up the amount of storage and information that needs to go into specifying a scene. Now, textures are really critical. For example, if you take a look at the character on the slide here, typically the meshes that we use to store geometry in this case, uh, this is a quad dominant mesh. Um, what that means is that there's both quadrilaterals as well as triangles on this mesh. Just a fun vocabulary word in case you're curious. This mesh is relatively low frequency or the amount of uh, detail in this mesh is pretty low, right? I mean, if I gave you this 3D surface on the left, it would look very smooth. But the character on the right hand side uh, he looks pretty high frequency, right? There's a lot of interesting texture here. He's got dirt on his face. You can see changes in his hair. Um, the lips and the eyes look more shiny than the skin. And the way that we're able to do that is to use the texture map. That is to say, even in the interior of these different quads, the texture on the surface is able to change. And that's the technology that we're going to talk about today. So if we want to do this from data, the strategy that we're going to use is called texture mapping. And texture mapping is a pretty straightforward idea. It's kind of like wrapping wallpaper or wrapping paper around a surface with high frequency information. Um, essentially, the uh, high frequency details are going to be stored in an image, which is just a standard format like JPEG or PNG. And then we're going to store a mapping from the 3D geometry into that image uh, to tell us how to actually draw the texture on the fly. Now, philosophically speaking, I think this is kind of an interesting idea. Uh, in particular, one of the things that we seem to know about perception is that your eye is extremely sensitive to detail, but somehow it's okay if that detail is two-dimensional, it's just wrapped on the surface. So, for example, on this bunny uh, model here, admittedly, this is not the world's best uh, 3D model of a bunny, um, but I think that we perceive high frequency texture, or maybe even fur on the side of the bunny model, even though the scale of the triangles here is nowhere close to the scale of the individual fibers of the fur. And so, Essentially, this was the really key breakthrough in texture mapping and related techniques is that it's okay to have sort of low detail geometry and then high detail texture and to get the best of both worlds here. So how are we going to do that? Well, in a texture map, essentially we're going to compute a mapping which says for every vertex in this triangle mesh, where does it go in some image which contains the texture kind of like a rug <laughs> splayed out? Uh, so that's what, here's what that looks like. So for every single triangle, or rather every vertex of every triangle, you get a different position in the, uh, the texture map image, uh, which is shown on the right hand side here. Now there's a few things that are worth noting about this image. Um, for one, uh, notice that there are lots of discontinuities, right? You have a continuous bunny on the left-hand side, um, but on the right-hand side, 
uh, he's torn into pieces. And this is actually necessary, right? The bunny, uh, from a topological perspective, is a sphere, right? It's a round object without any boundary, and you're trying to smash it into the plane. And you know that that's simply not possible without uh, introducing some seams. So if you're curious, the uh, vocabulary word is that when the texture map is discontinuous, this is called a seam. And seams are a necessary part of life when we do texture mapping of 3D models. Right? You're taking something spherical and you're mapping it into the plane. So what does that mean? Well, in practice, what that means is if I have two adjacent triangles, they may get mapped to very different parts of the texture map. So for instance, one of those triangles might be right along the boundary of one seam, and then maybe that jumps over the seam and goes somewhere over here. What does that imply about how we store our texture map? Well, it might be tempting to simply store for every vertex in our triangle mesh a position in the texture image, but that turns out to be not quite correct. And the reason why is that if you have a seam edge like here, then we should really think of taking these two triangles and breaking them apart like that. And now, the same vertex on the two sides of the edge can end up in different positions in our texture map, like what I've shown you here uh, on the right-hand side. So what does that mean? That means that really, the amount of information that we need to store a texture map looks like uh, two times three times the number of triangles. <laughs> and let's think about what this uh, expression means for a second. This is something that you guys should make sure that you check your understanding pretty well. So essentially, the 3t here is to say that every triangle has three vertices, and every one of those vertices needs a position in the UV map. So this is different. It is not equal to the number of vertices times two. In particular, the reason why is that we may have to cut apart edges, so it makes sense to simply store a different texture coordinate, even for the same vertex, every time it appears in a different triangle. You should make sure that you understand this distinction, uh, and it's basically needed in order to have seams in a texture map, but I think it's one that's a little bit counterintuitive the first time that you think about it. Okay, so there are many different names for the texture map. Um, a very typical one is to call these UV coordinates. The reason why is that we can assign axes U and V uh, to the texture map image, and this is to distinguish it from the X, Y, uh, Z. Oops, I've drawn a uh, left-handed coordinate system here. Um, the X, ah, and Y, and Z uh, coordinate that you might have in 3D. And so, uh, right, so now all of our vertices have all kinds of information connected to them. They have X, Y, Z coordinates in 3D, and in addition to that, they have these UV coordinates in the texture map image. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Essentially, every vertex, I should really say every vertex in every triangle, so this is to say that if a vertex is shared among multiple triangles, I might store a different UV for each one, stores these texture coordinates. And these are just a position in the 2D image that are going to give us uh, the texture at that point. So how do we fill texture in the interior of a triangle? Well, essentially, we're going to use the same trick that we've already developed a few lectures ago, namely to use barycentric coordinates. So let's see what that looks like. Suppose that I want to shade a triangle. So during my ray tracer, I intersect my ray, and it gets this orange point that you see on the left-hand side. Now, these vertices might be in 3D, and so I can compute the barycentric coordinates of the orange point relative to the vertices of the triangle, namely the green, the blue, and the red points on the outside. That gives me three values, alpha, beta, and gamma. Now, once I have those barycentric coordinates, remember that every one of the vertices of that triangle is associated to its own UV coordinates. 
So I can very centrically interpolate those UV coordinates to the interior point. And when I do that, it gives me a position in the texture map. I read off the color of the image in that texture map, and that is the color that I display at that pixel. So why does that make sense? Well, one thing that you need to be clear on is that the 3D triangle is not the same as the 2D triangle in the image plane. So essentially what's going on here is that you find, you compute the barycentric coordinates in 3D, and then you use the same barycentric coordinates in 2D to figure out what color to read in the texture map. So this procedure is called a texture lookup. And the basic idea to reiterate is that when I render a point in my geometry, I find the corresponding point in the texture map, I read off its color from the texture map image, and then I put it back here in my 3D rendered image. And notice that that's not the same as just taking this triangle here and then somehow copying it to the left, because of course, depending on the angle that I view the triangle at, um, the texture is likely to get distorted in this process. Okay, so let's detail this uh, algorithm just a tiny bit more, uh, specifically in the context of ray casting or ray tracing. So I start with a pixel XY on the image, and I uh, render from there, and I send a ray out into the scene. It hits a triangle, and in particular, it obtains alpha, beta, and gamma, which are the barycentric coordinates of the intersection of the ray with one of the triangles. That gives us the texture coordinates at that point by interpolating the texture coordinates of the three vertices of that triangle. And then I look up the texture color using those coordinates in the 2D image. So there's one detail here uh, which is missing, which is that of course, um, your texture is an image, right? So it's got, you know, width by height amount of information in it. But when you do that texture lookup, chances are you're not looking at triangles straight on, right? It's probably at an angle and a refractional thing, depending on when your camera is. And so most likely what will happen is that the pixels in your texture image are going to be sitting on this nice clean grid. And when you do your ray tracing, you know, you do your texture lookup and sadly, you end up with a fractional coordinate. And this is a bit of a problem, right? You have uh, colors only at these integer grid locations, but you have a fractional location uh, where you would like to know the color of your, uh, your rendered uh, image. So what are we gonna do? Well, we need to interpolate somehow. And there are many different strategies for how we could do this. The simplest thing to do might be to just round to the closest integer uh, grid location. So in other words, just grab the uh, closest color of a vertex nearby in uh, the, uh, the texture. So if we do that, um, what's gonna end up happening? Well, this nicely shaded uh, image that I've shown you in the background is actually not true, right? What you'll really get is that there's like a square in the interior of the pixel, all of which we'll get this green color in the corner. There's a square here, which will get this color, a square in the upper left, which will get this purple color, a square in the lower left, that'll get this kind of bluish color. So really, instead of getting a nicely, smoothly varying texture, so like if I get really up into the face of my 3D model, what I'll see is a bunch of discontinuities that happen at the half locations on the uh, lattice here. And so discontinue on discontinue. That doesn't look right. No, uh, whatever. Um, in any event, <laughs> it's not a good scene, right? Uh, essentially, rather than getting nice texture interpolation, uh, what you're getting is just a bunch of discontinuous values. Uh, and so this is really not a good thing, especially for scenes where I get really up close to my texture map and I can start to see the space in between the pixels. So instead, a more typical strategy, um, although we're going to cover some more sophisticated ones in some future lectures, is to use bilinear interpolation. And that looks like this. Suppose that I want the texture at some point in the interior of the domain. Here's how I'm going to obtain it. Well, 
remember that my texture has a y coordinate and an x coordinate. So I'm first going to interpolate linearly in the x coordinates to guess the color that would happen at the x coordinate of the point that I'm trying to evaluate. Then I'm going to interpolate vertically to get the final color at the center. And I can do both of those in just a linear fashion. Um, one thing that you can convince yourself is that I just did this in horizontal and then vertical order, but that you actually get the same result if you do vertical and then horizontal. And that is what's creating this nice shading in the background of this square here. So even though our image, our texture image, only contains information at these four points, we can fill in some shading in between just by using a bilinear map. So what does that allow us to do? What that allows us to do is to zoom really close to a textured surface. And yeah, the texture is not going to look great. It's just going to look interpolated. But at the very least, it looks smooth. Now, when we talk about anti-aliasing, we'll talk about even more sophisticated filters uh, that can capture some more detail in the image. But for now, this is probably good enough. So this is often called texture magnification. The idea is that the texture is associated with the 3D geometry, but as I interact with the shape, it gets closer to the camera, it gets farther away, and in effect, what I'm doing is taking that texture image and I'm growing it and I'm shrinking it in the process. And so this texture interpolation procedure is used to handle the case where you're growing and the space between pixels in your texture is larger than the space between pixels in your output image. Hopefully that makes some sense. But there's actually another problem which somehow doesn't feel like a problem when you start, but turns out to be equally if not more important. And that is something called texture minification. So magnification is when you zoom in, minification is when you zoom out. So one thing that we might think is a good idea, but turns out to be a little bit dangerous, would to be have we is to have the most detailed texture map possible. So for example, maybe I have a video game and it has a character with a 3D hand here. And because I have, you know, my microscope available, I'm going to use the most detailed possible skin texture in order to render this hand. And I think, well, this is great because now I can, you know, get really, really, really close to that hand and I'm never going to run into this, uh, this interpolation problem that I just talked about in the previous slide. But instead, something else goes wrong. In particular, suppose that my image grid looks something like what I've shown you here. This was supposed to be evenly spaced at the purple points. I obviously didn't do a very good job. <laughs> um, but in other words, this is all just to say that the hand is taking up a very small piece of my final rendered image, right? There's relatively few pixels dedicated to the part of the image that contains the hand. Again, this is another example where the scale of the texture map image and the scale of the rendered image is very different. But now it's the opposite of what we talked about before. Well, in that case, what's going to happen? Let's take a look at two adjacent pixels in our rendered image marked in purple. And let's see where they ended up in the texture map. Notice that they're quite far apart. <laughs> so what goes on in this texture map between these two purple points? The answer is a lot. Right? The skin is wrinkling up and down, some parts are shiny, some parts are not, some parts are white, some parts are dark. And all of that gets completely missed because during my texture lookup, I just grab two pixel values and nothing in between. So what can happen during minification, in other words, as I zoom out from a surface with a detailed texture, is that I miss all of this high frequency detail that happens in between the pixels. So what'll happen when I render this image over here is it'll just look like noise. And that's because essentially the color that you get at each pixel is totally random. It could be one of the darker pixels here. It could be one of the lighter pixels here. And that basically happened by chance. So what's going to be the solution to fixing this, uh, this particular issue? Well, we'll talk about it more uh, in lectures to come, namely when we talk about anti-aliasing. But the basic trick here is that really, when your pixels are this far apart, you need your texture lookup 
to get some average color over a larger region, which is essentially uh, talking about all of the different space covered by the pixel on the left-hand side. This is beginning to sound kind of similar to our strategies in ray tracing, where we send multiple rays. Uh, one strategy for doing this is called a MIP map. MIP stands for multum in parvo, which I think is Latin for uh, much in little. And the idea here is to store not just the texture, but also a texture half as big, a texture half as big as that, and so on, uh, all the way to smaller and smaller sizes. Now, the reason to do that is that essentially one pixel in this texture mapped image corresponds to an entire region in the original image. And so essentially what's going to happen is that when I do my rendering, I'm going to choose which region in the mid map kind of looks like a similar scale to where I'm seeing my object in the 3D scene. And that's going to avoid many of these uh, minification problems. We're going to discuss this strategy more once we've talked a little more about sampling and anti-aliasing. So hopefully now you guys all understand what you can do once you have one of these UV maps. Again, the basic trick here is when you're rendering a triangle, once you have that ray triangle intersection, you use its barycentric coordinates to interpolate the UV coordinates on the boundary of the triangle. You then use those UV coordinates to look up the texture in the image. You might have to do bilinear interpolation or look up something in a different part of the MIP map. Then you copy that color back to the original uh, rendered object. Now, one question that I haven't answered, but is really critical here, is how do you obtain UV coordinates to begin with, right? So we spent all this time in our first two lectures talking about 3D modeling, but we didn't talk at all about how to attach texture coordinates to the vertices of a mesh. And it turns out there are many answers to this question. Sadly, there are many more answers to this question than we can cover uh, in one lecture in 6837, but I'm going to at least cover at a high level how to think about some of the strategies that people use. In particular, we'll mention three. The first one, which sounds kind of boring, but actually is one of the more common ways to obtain UVs, is to design them manually. The second is to use some closed form formulas for simple surfaces. And the third, which is really a nice area of study in computer graphics area, is to automatically compute UV coordinates using an optimization routine. So let's talk about each of these strategies in a little bit more detail. Now, one of the most common ways to obtain texture coordinates, which from my perspective as a geometry researcher is the tiniest bit disappointing, is to just specify them manually. So many different tools like 3D Studio Max and, and others um, contain uh, specialized tools where artists can actually take the 3D model and manually map them into the plane. Now, when I say manually, I mean, if you look at this texture map here, you'll see like this looks awfully regular for some person to have painstakingly placed every single vertex. And, and that's absolutely right. So that's not really what happens, but the reality is there's a lot of artist control. So maybe they specify, you know, many of the different destinations for boundary points. Maybe they specify some other key points like these singularities. And the artist just starts pinning down points. And then as it does that, the computer fills in just kind of a smooth set of coordinates in between. And this is just a manual process. And it turns out that there's a lot of rules of thumb that artists use for designing UV coordinates. So for example, texture seams sometimes are a little bit visible, uh, even when the texture looks the same on the two sides of the seam, like the interpolation might go slightly wrong. And so a very typical strategy might be to place the seams in the textured map in some regions that you're unlikely to see, like underneath the arms or behind the ears and so on. Um, this kind of UV mapping work, it's like almost analogous to clothing design, <laughs> right? You're somehow taking the body and wrapping it in this other 2D uh, coordinate system. It's really painstaking and even though some artists are very good at it, I would argue that essentially they're making up for what we as computer scientists and engineers have failed at a little bit. Um, that if the real goal here is just to get an effective map of, three, of a 3D surface into the plane, somehow over the long term, my personal hope as a geometry researcher is that 
we can make a lot of this manual UV mapping irrelevant um, or unnecessary. So current strategies, uh, unfortunately, don't live up to the standard of, of artist designed UV maps, but some of them get close. And it's worth mentioning a few that are used in practice, both when efficiency is needed or when low quality UV maps are kind of good enough. So one strategy is to just use a closed form function. So for example, for certain surfaces like spheres and um, cylinders, there's some well-known functions that parameterize these things. So for example, um, there's spherical coordinates, uh, right? I think usually those are what, phi and theta or something like that. Uh, you could also uh, have cylindrical coordinates, for example, you know, the height um, and the angle and so on. And these give perfectly reasonable UV maps. So in this particular case, like if I know that I'm rendering a cylinder, what do I do? Well, rather than computing a mesh of the cylinder, attaching UV coordinates to every vertex and so on, if I know specifically that I'm rendering a cylinder, once I intersect a ray with my surface, I can just figure out the height and the angle and use those two things to look up into a texture map. So these are just closed form formulas. Uh, this can work even when you have a curved piece of geometry. So for example, maybe uh, for the bunny here, all we're doing is just kind of holding up an image to the bunny's side. So you're kind of ignoring one of the coordinates and projecting into the image that way. So this strategy is extremely simple. <laughs> Obviously, there's not a whole lot going on here. Uh, and it's kind of nice for texture mapping purposes because you can read the texture map off as a formula in terms of the vertex positions but it's not super extensible, right? It's mostly for simple surfaces that are easy to work with. That said, there's some pretty common strategies uh, in different areas that are worth knowing about. So one of the common closed form uh, uh, texture coordinates is to use projective mappings. This is kind of the reverse of rendering in some sense, where you'll have your 3D object and essentially similarly to your rendering, you'll have some image in a camera position. And in order to get your texture coordinates, you'll compute the position of the 3D point on the image given the camera position and then use that for your texture lookup. This is particularly useful in certain computer vision applications where one thing you could do would be to take a really nice photograph of this teapot from this angle. But now I want to render it from a slightly different angle. So what am I gonna do? Well, I'll render this pixel, do my usual ray triangle intersection, but then when I wanna compute the color, I'll do the lookup in this other direction here. Uh, and so for some uh, texturing of objects that essentially you just photographed the object and now you want to render it from an arbitrary angle, this is a very simple texture map that will suffice. And so in order to do this, it's pretty simple. Um, you just have the camera matrix associated to the projector, like the image with the texture in it. We covered this in, I think, the third or fourth lecture of this course. Uh, and then it's really just a question of multiplying by that projection in order to get those 2D coordinates. So one place where this strategy is particularly common is in an area called image-based rendering. This is sort of exactly what it sounds like, is rendering based on photographs. Um, so for example, here we see the, uh, I think this is the Campanile at Berkeley terrible football team over there, but they have some reasonable architecture, I suppose. And uh, one nice thing about uh, Berkeley architecture, you can tell I went to Stanford, uh, is that it's very simple. <laughs> um, in particular, it's not so hard to have a 3D model of this uh, object here built out of basically, you know, squares and triangles and so on. So in image-based rendering, maybe I walk around the Campanile with my camera and I snap a bunch of photos of it from different angles. And using the strategy that we detailed on the previous slide, now given a new camera angle, I can try to render the same 3D object using lookups into those photographs that I just took. And the results can be pretty impressive, even in a fairly dated uh, little movie clip here. So let's, uh, let's watch for a minute. <laughs> you can see it's pretty dated. Ugh, Berkeley. 
So we're going to transition in a moment from uh, obviously videotape scene to a rendering. And this is done using image-based rendering techniques. So again, essentially all that's going on here is a very simple texture map that's mapping into a set of photographs that we took of the surface. And the texture map is known in closed form, right? It's just computed by uh, essentially inverting the, the, not even inverting, but applying the camera transformation uh, that is known given the pose of the camera that took the image. Now, a more modern approach to texture mapping tries to do more than just compute some closed form function. Um, in particular, while that might work for simple objects or objects whose texture was captured by just taking a photograph, it's less clear how to do that when an artist makes a 3D model of an object. And so the optimization approach to obtaining UV coordinates is to take a 3D model and to actually try to kind of squash it down into the plane. And so in other words, you have a particular optimization problem where your goal is to flatten a 3D object. And for each vertex, you need to find its UV coordinates so that distortion is minimized. Now, what is distortion? Well, essentially, the triangle that you have on the surface in 3D may get distorted when you stick it into the plane. It might get bent or stretched or whatever. And so the distortion of the uh, triangle map uh, into the plane, you might want to preserve edge lengths or interior angles or many other quantities. And people in computer graphics, specifically in the area of geometry processing, have spent quite a lot of time um, proposing different measures of distortion. Beyond that, if you have a really fancy automatic parametrization tool, this is a modern problem to study. You also have to figure out where to place the seams. Uh, so a very typical uh, way to do that might also be to uh, insert seams in places that are hard to see or places where there's particularly high distortion in a texture map. This is, I think, an area that's ripe for additional work. So for those of you who are interested in machine learning, Maybe what we should be doing is watching artists parameterize a bunch of surfaces and then imitating where they place seams because there's some artistic or semantic content hiding there rather than just a mathematical computation. In any event, there's many different approaches to optimizing for parameterization. If you like this kind of stuff, you should be sure to take my course 6838 in the spring, um, but we'll briefly mention a few. So one of the simplest ones is using a strategy. Uh, this is sometimes called the tut embedding due to the original person who uh, proposed this strategy a long time ago. It was originally for graphs, but it turns out to work well for 3D surfaces, where essentially you solve a linear system of equations to compute UV coordinates. This only works for disk-shaped surface, meaning that it's not a sphere, but rather the outer boundary can be mapped to a circle. So what you do is you fix the UV coordinates for all the boundary points. So in other words, you just prescribe like this point goes here, that point goes there and so on. And your goal is to fill in the internal positions. By the way, when you fix the boundary, you can do this in a relatively simple way, right? Like you could number all of the uh, vertices on the outside of the model and then just place them at equal angles around a circle it would be a very simple, if perhaps high distortion strategy. And now you solve a linear system that says, I want every vertex to be at the average of its neighbors. So in other words, let's kind of zoom in to some piece of our parameterization. So we have a vertex whose position in the UV domain is unknown, but we're gonna say that a good parameterization is one where that vertex's position is roughly the average of its neighbor's positions. So this is a linear condition. Do you see that? Essentially what it's saying is that VI is equal to the one over the valence. So this is the number of neighbors times the sum over all the neighbors of their positions. So this is like VJ. And so in practice, what Tut's embedding is trying to do is to place every vertex at the average of its neighbors. But of course, the neighbor's positions are all unknown too, 
with the exceptions of the points along the boundary. So what ends up happening here is that this is a linear system of equations that says place each V in the center of its neighbors and prescribe the positions of the vertices on the boundary. This turns out to be full rank, and when you invert this matrix, the tut parameterization has some really nice properties. So in particular, one thing you can show is that as long as the boundary is convex, then this uh, is actually a bijective map, meaning the triangles can't flip over or take up uh, different pieces of the plane. Incidentally, if you didn't understand some details here, that's okay. This is advanced material intended mostly to give you guys some fun Google search terms to look up later. And indeed, because I'm a geometry researcher, I thought for fun, I can share some pretty modern uh, ideas. So essentially, nowadays, when we study uh, the parameterization problem, the goal is to find some map phi that has relatively low distortion, taking your 3D surface into the 2D domain. Now, for those of you who like numerical problems or optimization, this is a really interesting one, and, and it's quite differently structured from many of the ones that we encounter, for example, in statistics, right? So strategies like stochastic gradient descent work, don't work terribly well here um, for a lot of different reasons. For one, the objective terms are built out of distortions of a million little tiny triangles rather than just like a giant expectation over a data set. And moreover, there are a ton of constraints in our optimization problem because we want our map to be injective. What does that mean? That means if two triangles occupy the same piece of the plane, this is bad news, right? Because essentially what that means is that our texture map, if I texture this, tri this triangle on the left, it has to get the same texture at this point as this triangle on the right, which really doesn't make sense in the texture mapping problem. And so if you think about it, you have this extremely large scale optimization problem with one variable per vertex of your mesh and many, many, many constraints saying that no two triangles can occupy the same piece of the plane. This is a tough problem and one that every year, if you attend the SIGGRAPH conference uh, uh, in computer graphics, you'll see people propose different techniques for solving. In fact, at this point, minimizing distortion is, I wouldn't say a solved problem, but it's fairly well studied. One of the big frontiers is to deal with introducing cuts along the surface to uh, get this nice cut up version of your surface um, rather than asking somebody to manually chop up your surface. This is a really tricky problem because you're trading off between many different considerations. Um, in particular, the easiest way to get a parameterization with zero distortion is to cut out every single triangle, right? So if you have a triangle mesh, oops, that's a pretty lame triangle mesh. Um, so here uh, are two triangles. Um, one way that I could always map them to the plane without any distortion is to cut those two triangles apart. And now just place them one after the next into the plane. And if I do that for every single triangle independently, well, I'll get a zero distortion triangle maps, but I'll get tons and tons and tons and tons of cuts, right? One cut for every edge. So that's not too good. You'll get a ton of distortion, um, or not distortion, but rather discontinuities in your texture map, but you'll get no distortion. On the other hand, it might be that you can glue some triangles together, increase the distortion somewhat, and greatly reduce the number of seams. And so there's a really tough trade-off that's tough to uh, navigate there. So for fun, I thought I'd show you a little video clip of some work that we did a couple years ago showing one strategy that tries to kind of negotiate this trade-off between distortion and complexity of the cut. So here we started with that tut parameterization to a circle, and now what's going on is the algorithm is actually cutting up the surface a little bit and then alternating between these cut operations and re reducing the distortion, which you're seeing in the different colors. So if you look on the right-hand side, you can see these little cracks moving along the surface, which are the texture seams. And the more seams that we add, the better the distortion measure gets per triangle. Um, but it's balancing that with the length of the cut along the surface. I think we'll see some more examples. Now, if you spy at the uh, clock that's given um, at the end of the animation or on the upper right, right here, you can see that this is running in 5x speed relative to the uh, 
actual speed of the computation. So this is a pretty slow uh, technique. So it's cur currently, it's certainly the case that if you download a piece of software that automatically does texture mapping, reduces the distortion of your map and introduces all the cuts, unfortunately you gotta wait. <laughs> uh, these algorithms can be pretty slow. And to some extent that makes good sense, right? I mean, they're solving a pretty complicated problem. But this is the kind of thing that I expect to improve quite a bit over the next uh, few years. Oops, it looks like it uh, chopped off his head there. Okay. So now that we have a few strategies for obtaining a texture map, let's talk about what to do with it. Um, there are many different strategies here. So uh, one thing that's worth noting is that um, we can build a small texture and have it repeat many times. Um, so for example, if I want a, a brick, um, maybe I think of my texture coordinates as somehow periodic, and that's how I'm going to tile the texture on itself. One clever thing that people do is they purposefully design textures so that they can be tiled and you won't see the difference. Obviously, this brick pattern doesn't really accomplish that goal, but uh, this weird psychedelic yellow thing does. Um, if you want to be an artist drawing textures that have this nice wrapping property, one way to do it is to make a user interface where you have your texture that you're drawing here, right? So here is texture. And then adjacent to it, you draw a few copies of the texture, right? So as you paint here, the same thing will appear in all of the different squares around your texture. So that way, if you draw a paint stroke and you accidentally cross into this region, you'll end up seeing that it also affects all these different spots over here. So I think that's what that user interface typically looks like. So one thing that we've already mentioned in today's lecture is that texture maps can be used to alter any of the constants in this illumination equation. So if you have your BRDF, any of the constants like the diffuse, specular, uh, ambient lighting terms, all of which can vary from point to point by using a lookup into your texture map. Uh, and so this is a very typical thing to do is to store texture maps that contain each one of these values in a different image. And that's what creates these extremely detailed uh, models. So for example, here you see probably a piece of uh, metal that was modeled using like two triangles, right? Just like that divided in half. But then of course the texture map is extremely complicated. You can see that it has varying uh, shininess, right? Like the KS uh, is changing a lot depending whether you're rusty or uh, metallic. Uh, and the color uh, is also varying quite a bit, which is the uh, KD term. And in fact, we can go even further than this. There are all kinds of fun extensions. Um, so one thing to notice is that the normal vector on the surface is really important for conveying detail. Uh, remember that all of your lighting computations are based on computing that cosine with the normal. And so one thing that you can do is actually store the direction of the normal map, the normal in a texture map. This is called normal mapping or bump mapping. It is super cool because what it's doing is you're, since you're storing the normal in a high frequency texture, as you rotate your 3D surface, the illumination is changing as if your surface has these little micro bumps, even though really behind the scenes, you're storing a very coarse triangle mesh, which is a really clever trick. So in normal mapping, essentially, the normal is just given by some 2D image that you store along with your 3D model, um, which is a really nice idea. So normal mapping is used for many reasons. Um, one is to add some artist designed information to your image. Another reason to do normal mapping is actually to do mesh compression. So take a look at this mesh on the right. This mesh contains about 4 million triangles, which is quite a bit. Now, one thing that we could do to save space on our computer is to say, well, that's too much information. So instead, we're going to store an extremely coarse mesh, <laughs> uh, like what you see on the left-hand side. Now, obviously, this 500 triangle mesh, if you rendered it, won't look too good, right? I mean, you can see what it looks like. So one really clever trick is to simplify your original geometry 
to get this D, this coarse mesh here. But then to compute a normal map by looking in the interiors of the triangles and reading the normal map values off of the original triangle mesh. So rather than having just a 4 million triangle mesh, we're going to have a 500 triangle mesh plus a map into a normal texture that I can store as an image. And you can see that the detail on the right hand side is nearly as good. And this is a very common strategy. Um, sometimes people even paint the normal map. Sometimes they just use it by simplifying a piece of geometry. Um, so here's another really fabulous example of a uh, pretty coarse piece of geometry. I guess you can see just a little bit in the corner here um, that looks extremely detailed because the shading is being modulated by a pretty high resolution normal map. And the nice thing is that storing an image is way cheaper than storing a triangle mesh. Uh, image compression techniques are extremely sophisticated and images are nice regular grids of information instead of irregular piles of triangles. So there's a lot more that you can do with this that still makes your texture and your nice fancy 3D mesh uh, fit into a small amount of space on your graphics card. So in order to generate normal maps, for example, this, this image that you see here, um, one strategy that you can use, uh, which I already alluded to a bit, uh, is noted on the slide here, where essentially you start with a detailed mesh, and now um, you simplify that mesh, and when you do so, you essentially map from each vertex in the simplified mesh to its corresponding normal in the dense mesh. So one way to do that is to generate a UV parameterization of the detailed mesh. So you have like your UV image here. Well, probably it's U and V like that. You have your detailed surface. And then you have your coarse surface. So in the first step here, you're going to compute a UV mapping from this guy into the plane. And the reason to do that is that um, now for every pixel in this UV map, I can look upstairs and read off the normal vector. And now we simplify the mesh to get this coarse guy. And we're going to overlay the same UV map uh, into the same uh, planar domain. So now when I render this course map, I look downstairs from the normal vector and essentially what I'm getting are the normals from the more detailed model. So at render time, I basically throw away the detailed 3D model and just keep track of the course one and the UV texture here. This is one of these things that's somehow hard to keep straight in your head and hard to explain in words. Hopefully you guys understand the gist of it. And if you don't, of course, you should uh, ping us with questions and ideas. So there are some details that are worth mentioning for normal mapping that are a bit annoying. Um, one of them is coordinate frames. Um, so now if you take that coarse 3D model and you like rotated it, then using the strategy I just suggested on the previous slide, your normals would need to rotate with the 3D model. That can be a little bit tricky, so typically um, maybe you store the normal relative to the tangent plane of the triangle or something like that. It's also very difficult to combine normal maps with tiling, and the reason why is that if I do tiling, for example, on a, a sphere, then depending on where I am on the surface, the texture could be pinching more and more. Um, or a different uh, effects can happen because of the curvature of the surface that you have to account for. So I think combining tiling and normal mapping is typically not done a whole lot, but I could be wrong. And if you guys have pointers uh, toward strategies people use there, I'd be curious to hear about them. So the basic point here is that normal mapping is an extremely good idea. Essentially, it allows you to have really high frequency detail, but only use two dimensional image storage to obtain it. But some of the extensions like tiling no longer work, but that's okay. All right, so in the last chunk of our lecture today, we're going to talk about a different strategy for texturing surfaces, uh, and this is to use procedural textures. So procedural textures provide us with an alternative to texture mapping. 
the idea here is that for some textures, we really don't need to store it in an image like a JPEG or a PNG, but instead we're going to write a little program that computes the color as a function of position on the surface and directly maps it to color. And so this can be useful. So for example, let's say that I want to render this checkerboard here. There's really no reason for me to store a photograph of a checkerboard in order to do that, right? One thing I could do is say, I don't know, if my X coordinate and my Y coordinate are odd, then I make it red. And if they're even, then I make it yellow or something like that. Um, so those sorts of rules I can write in code rather than storing a texture map image. And that can save me both space and memory. So during a uh, rendering process, I no longer have to page that texture and look up an arbitrary color value. So procedural textures lead us to a really key idea. And this is one that I'm going to put like lots of stars around so that you guys remember to study it later. Because it's going to come up quite a bit when we talk about graphics cards. And that idea is a shader. So shaders were developed at this point a fairly long time ago. Essentially, they're little functions that are ex executed when light interacts with the surface. So you actually write an independent piece of code that says, given maybe the position of the ray triangle intersection, the colors of the three vertices, the barycentric uh, coordinates of the hit, um, the ambient diffuse and specular components, the, I don't know, Fresnel coefficient, whatever you need for rendering um, goes into the shader. And then what you output is the reflected color. And so this is basically just a nice way to factor your code. You're providing a shader with a function um, whose job in life is to determine color from all the useful information you could possibly need. And over the years, people have actually developed what can be understood as specialized programming languages for shaders, everything from RenderMan uh, to GLSL, which you guys are working with in your homework a little bit. So initially, shaders were used for production style rendering, so like slow rendering code. Um, RenderMan, which was developed at Pixar, uh, was one of the early shaders. And essentially, it was super useful because it allowed people to specify things like materials and so on in a way that was a bit independent of all the other stuff going on in rendering. But nowadays, essentially motivated by graphics hardware, um, real time uh, graphics use shaders all over the place. In fact, OpenGL has its own built-in shader programming language called GLSL. Uh, and your graphics hardware um, actually has machinery for evaluating shaders on the fly right on your graphics card. Um, so one thing you can do is actually compile a shader for a specific graphics card and then give it a run. Um, and these are extremely efficient little chunks of code. Um, so this actually greatly increases the efficiency of the rendering process, uh, because which is really important because shaders are evaluated millions of times, right? Um, you're going to need to call shader at least one time per pixel and perhaps more than one time. Um, shaders often make use of texture mapping quite a bit to read off specular ambient and other uh, properties uh, from a triangle mesh, for example. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So a different style of shader could be a procedural texture, which doesn't have any information at all about a texture map, but rather um, maybe gets the uh, color of your model just from the position in space, the position of the ray triangle intersection, uh, and so on. The advantages here are that procedural textures are easy to implement. They're often more compact. It's just a short piece of code rather than like a giant texture map. And they're infinite resolution, right? All these matters like zooming in too close or zooming in, zooming away too far from your texture really don't matter anymore because they're closed form functions. I can evaluate them with an arbitrary amount of detail. The disadvantage is that it requires you to write code. So it's a bit unintuitive. Certain artists might not be willing to write procedural shaders. And if you have an existing texture, it can be pretty tough to match it. So like if I take a picture of an interesting object and I want to replicate it digitally, then I have to write code that produces that texture rather than just wrapping the photograph around the 3D model, right? That would be the texture mapping strategy. There's one really predominant strategy for procedural uh, texturing, which is worth uh, mentioning because it's been around a long time. And this approach is called Perlin noise. 
So Perlin Noise, which is named after Ken Perlin, I believe he's now a professor at NYU, is some weird hybrid between white noise, like just speckles, and something smooth. So this is a nice example of what Perlin Noise in a simple setup looks like. You can see that at some granularity, this is essentially a random pattern, right? The uh, waviness between black and white uh, is happening in a randomly generated way but it's not happening at every single pixel. Rather, there's some level of blurriness here um, that makes this texture look a bit smooth. So this is a pseudo random function. There is random number generator going on inside of Perlin noise, but it's continuous. And in particular, we've applied a band pass filter, meaning that somebody has given rough length scale and said that below this length scale, I want my texture to look smooth but on larger length scales, I want it to look random. This is going to be a useful ingredient for adding visual detail in procedural shading, which we'll see over the next couple of slides. So what are the requirements of Perlin noise? We'd like to be pseudo random. We're going to need it to work in different dimensions. So a very typical one is to need actually four dimensional noise for a position plus time. We need it to be smooth at a certain small prescribed scale and random at a large one. And then a last one, which was particularly important in the history of graphics, but still important now because graphics data takes up a lot of space, is to use relatively little memory. So we're going to cover the high level idea of Perlin noise. This is another pretty common project topic in 6837 if you're looking for something to implement. And here's the basic strategy. So in Perlin noise, we're going to make a function that basically averages out to zero. It's pretty easy to make that average out to some other number by adding a constant shift. So what we're going to do is at the integer locations, we're just going to prescribe that our Perlin noise equals zero. And at each integer location, we're going to randomly generate a slope at that point. So Again, to reiterate, the function is zero at all the integer positions, but the slope of the function is randomly generated at the integer positions. And so what we're going to do is when we want to evaluate our Perlin noise at a uh, given position P, well, what we're going to do is to use nothing more than essentially the spline machinery that we've already talked about in this class. Notice that between P if we look at the interval that contains the two closest integer points, what do we have? Well, we have two values, both of which are zero in this case. We also have two tangents. Does that remind you guys of anything? I sure hope it does. In particular, we can use a spline to prescribe what goes on in our texture, uh, our Perlin noise, in between each of the integer locations. In particular, this should look an awful lot like the Hermit basis. So what do we do? Well, essentially we have two gradients or slopes at nearby points. We have some fractional x coordinate dx from, uh, which is, you can think of kind of like a displacement from the previous integer grid uh, location. We know that the value is zero at these vertices. So when you work through your spline formulas, you get something, oops, which I'm realizing is a bit messy on our slide here. <laughs> um, but essentially it's just a weighted average of the uh, slopes on the two, the two sides here. So one way to view it is that you kind of extrapolate a line from the left point with the first slope. You extrapolate a line from the right point with the second slope. And then you average those two values based on some weight that depends on the distance uh, to the two integer points. These are just formulas and you guys can look them up at home. I'm sorry, these, these numbers should be exponents. <laughs> That's a typo. Okay, um, so in any event, I think you guys could all derive these formulas at this point. Just remember that you have two zero values and two slopes. So this is nothing more than an Hermit spline interpolating randomly generated slopes at the integer grid locations. So if you want to do Perlin noise in a higher dimension, well, it's basically the same thing. You just now randomly um, generate X, Y, and Z slopes at each of the uh, vertices of a cubic lattice, for example, in 3D. 
um, your Perlin noise is still zero at the vertices. Uh, and then um, you can use, for example, bilinear or trilinear interpolation to uh, get these spline interpolated values in between using the same strategy that we mentioned at the very beginning of today's lecture. So the algorithm in 3D, given some input point in the interior of our domain here, is to look at the neighboring grid points. Oops, actually, I'm sorry, this is point P here. <laughs> so these are the neighboring grid points. There are eight total. And now, just like when we introduce bilinear interpolation when talking about texture maps, exactly the same thing is happening here. We've done interpolation along these lines to obtain these four values. Yeah. Then we interpolated vertically, and then finally once through the volume. There are a couple details in Perlin noise that at least historically were quite important. I think now that space is cheap on our computer, it's a little bit less so. Um, one typical hack in Perlin noise is just the storing a giant grid worth of random slopes at every vertex is kind of expensive. So one thing that Perlin suggested was to randomly generate a list of n randomly generated gradients and then to just kind of periodically keep looping over that list as we move along our grid. And that's essentially what's going on in this formula here. This is really an implementation detail. Essentially what you want is just a random slope per vertex and you don't want to use too much space generating it. Um, but for instance, this strategy really reduces the uh, amount of storage in Perlin noise to n, where n is the size of your table. And then you're using this procedural lookup uh, strategy to compensate uh, for your lack of a big grid of data. So why did we go to all this work? Hopefully you guys get at least a high level idea of what Perlin noise is doing. Well, let's take a look at some of the magic that Perlin observed using this basic trick. So here's a sphere rendered with Perlin noise. So I think here what's going on is that the Perlin noise is just some function I think here's the blue channel, um, maybe the red channel of X, Y, Z, right? So this is a Perlin noise in three variables. And the scale of the Perlin noise in the uh, parlance that Perlin, I guess, proposed, we, we call this an octave. Uh, this is to, I guess, invoke some ideas from, uh, you know, harmonic analysis or, or, or audio. So what can we do? Well, we can generate Perlin noise at different scales and then combine them in different ways. So for instance, here we have a low frequency blue texture on the sphere. And now we could use a different octave, which is a much higher frequency of Perlin noise, but maybe with a different scale. And now we're starting to get an object that already kind of looks like a planet. Now, was this anything particularly scientific? No, but it just seems to be a useful artistic uh, tool for designing procedural textures. And essentially, this was extremely impactful work that just showed that this one sort of simple trick for generating noise at different scales can then be combined in different creative ways to make for interesting looking textures on a surface. So here we just have two different scales of noise. And I believe, yep, each octave uh, here, I forget if it's two or it might be more than two, um, is weighted uh, one over uh, F. So, you know, the low frequency hit gets the biggest weight uh, and the high frequencies get smaller weights. And that's not, more, that's not all you can do. It turns out that you can do all kinds of clever tricks to make for interesting textures. So, for example, Perlin noise is pretty smooth. And maybe that's not so good. Like maybe you want some C1 discontinuities. So like functions that are mostly differentiable, but every once in a while they have some point where their value changes. So that would be a C1 discontinuity because the slope has changed. One way to do that is to remember that Perlin noise averages out to zero, right? So if I take my Perlin noise and I take its absolute value, then every once in a while it has this C1 discontinuity. And when I start adding that onto our texture, now we're starting to get some interesting artifacts having to do, they, they look quite complex, but really they're just randomly generated and have these C1 discontinuities thanks to the absolute value. And in fact, you can go crazy with this stuff. So for instance, if you want this interesting looking marble texture, essentially what went on here is we 
added Perlin noise to the X coordinate and then took the sine of this. This is just like a weird modeling decision. There, you know, there's no particular reason why. So you can see what sine is doing. Roughly, it's alternating between these brown and white regions on the surface here. And this whole texture is produced just using a few lines of code in the Perlin noise setup. So this was the really brilliant idea in Perlin noise that essentially by generating noise that averages out to zero, is noisy on one scale and smooth on another, and can be combined in different ways, you can achieve all kinds of interesting procedural textures. So for example, there are the ones that we saw today just by cooking up different formulas in terms of these basic ingredients. Uh, in fact, um, Perlin showed that there's all kinds of cool things that you can do with this. Everything from some version of marble, like what you've already seen. Um, if you convert to polar coordinates and uh, add Perlin noise, you can get some interesting kind of wood texture. Essentially, now you're evaluating the noise in the radius and the angle rather than just the uh, X, Y, and Z coordinates. Or here's a funny example of computing a corona of the uh, sun variety. <laughs> um, so here, uh, I believe there's a color gradient, which was modeled as just yellow dropping off to red. Um, there's some circular components and different phase shifts. And then just a circle was cut out of the inside. So Perlin noise is one of these ideas that just appears everywhere in graphics. I mean, it's a simple concept, just low frequency, but still random noise. Um, so for example, displacement mapping and fur even can be guided by creating Perlin noise. Um, and so in the movie and video game industries, this is one strategy for essentially a very compact way to get very high frequency and interesting looking detail, even if it's completely no uh, random. And so this is basically this nice advantage of writing a shader, right? This Perlin noise can be generated with just a few lines of a shader. And you can get some really powerful effects without storing all of this stuff in different photographic uh, textures. And this can be used not only to control color, but also specular components, roughness, and other properties of your 3D surface. Moreover, uh, as we saw with that Corona example and a few others, your shaders can be layered, meaning that you can multiply them or add them together. You can use one shader to modulate another and so on. So this programmable shader idea provides a ton of flexibility in rendering. Um, they can get quite complex, even 10,000 lines of code in some of the uh, movie industry uh, shaders, probably the video game ones a little bit less so. Um, but the nice thing is that they really... Uh, separate out the art of designing a material from the art of designing a 3D scene. Um, of course, lots of experience is necessary to make a really sophisticated shaders. It's a little bit of a black art, very specialized uh, discipline, um, but there's some really creative and interesting things that you can do with this particular abstraction. So as a quick recap, hopefully you guys get the high level point, which is that most interesting materials vary spatially, like along a surface. We covered two main strategies for how to obtain the spatial variation. One of them was a texture map, which essentially maps the triangles of a 3D model into an image and then stores the high frequency texture in an image. And the other is to use procedural texturing, which is a piece of code that generates textures on the fly. So with these strategies, we can add a ton of detail in our 3D images essentially by just reusing information that we're storing in a two-dimensional or uh, image or a short program. And the amazing thing is that combined with the effects of 3D rendering, ray triangle intersection, and so on, make for really convincing images like what we've seen in today's lecture. So we're nowhere close to being done with uh, rendering, but we're one step closer to producing photorealistic, interesting images relatively efficiently. And we'll continue uh, that discussion in our next lecture. Thanks.